Hello everybody, welcome back to Me Club Wisdom. And so far I've been your host Siri Yeti and happy Fossil Day. Those of you who don't know, Fossil Day is a US holiday, typically in October, or this time it's October thirteenth in twenty twenty one. Uh it's simply the second week of October, the second Wednesday in October. Uh and it's all about the fossils of our past, wonderful extinct fauna. And so this week we're diving into that, with the first animal of the week being the platyhistrix, meaning flat porcupine, with a timnospondyl amphibian with a distinctive sail along its back, similar to the unrelated synapse into Dimetrodon adaphosaurus, which we have previously covered on this channel. Uh, platyhistrix was named and described by Willingston in 1911, uh, and it had a compact body reaching around three and a half feet long, including the tail with its skull being large and strongly built, uh, resembling a frog-like face. It sported a row of armor plates on its back and squat, sturdy legs, indicating a mainly terrestrial lifestyle. It is uncertain why Platyhistrix developed its iconic sail, some theories being that it formed a thermoregulatory function allowing Platyhistrix to control its body temperature, cooling off in the midday heat or warming up uh, early to hunt more sluggish, cold-blooded animals. Uh, perhaps the sail served a display function or even allowed it to blend in amongst the predatory sailback plecosaurs so that they did not mistake platyhistrix for prey. We don't know for certain at this stage, but it's equally possible that the sail may have served one or all of these po uh, possible p purposes. Platyhistrix lived throughout West North America during the late Carboniferous and early Permian periods. Here it inhabited seasonally dry, freshwater wetland environments, sporting a lifestyle somewhat similar to a modern toad, uh, acting as a small squat predator of arthropods, small reptiles, small synapses, and other amphibians. Bloody histories itself may have been preyed upon by larger amphibians such as erops, as well as synapses such as the aforementioned dimetrodon. Bloody histories is believed to have gone extinct as a result of the climate becoming drier uh, as the Permian went on, and went extinct to the Middle Permian around 278 million years ago. Next up is Velociraptor, which is the genus of Dromaeosaurid theropod dinosaur that lived approximately 75 to 70 million years ago during the latter part of the Cretaceous period. Um, the first fossils were just uncovered during a American Museum of Natural History expedition to the Outer Mongolian Gobi Desert, on the 11th of August, 1923, Peter Kazin recovered the first Velociraptor fossil known to science, a crushed but complete skull associated with one of the raptorial second toe claws. In 1924, the museum president Henry Fairfield Osborne designated the skull and claw as a type of specimen of the genus Velociraptor. Uh, during the Cold War, expeditions by Soviet, Soviet and Polish scientists, in collaboration with Mongolian colleagues, recovered several more specimens of Velociraptor, and uh, the most famous of these being the infamous Fighting Dinosaur specimen, which depicts a Velociraptor in battle against a Protoceratops, which was discovered by a Polish-Mongolian joint team in 1971. Today, two species of Velociraptor are recognized, with being Velociraptor mongoliensis and Velociraptor ozomolake. Velociraptor was a medium-sized dromaeosaur with adults measuring 6 foot 9 inches long and 1 foot 7 inches high at the, shoulder, at the hip, uh, and they weighed around 35 pounds in weight. The up to 10 inch long skull was uniquely up-curved, concaved, on the upper surface and convex on the lower. They had long arms, large hands, with three strongly curved claws. They were similar in construction and flexibility to the wings of modern birds. In 2007, paleontologists discovered quill knobs on a well-preserved Velociraptor forearm, confirming the presence of feathers in this animal. Velociraptor walked on only their third and fourth digits on their hind legs, with the second digit, for which the Velociraptor was famous for, uh, had a highly modified and uh, was highly modified and held a retractable claw off the ground. Was held retracted, held the claw retracted off the ground. I apologize. Um, this claw was up to two and a half inches long and was sickle shaped, and it was usually it was most likely used as a predatory device used to stab into and restrain struggling prey in a thing called raptor prey restraint. 
which can actually be seen in many large birds today. Uh, Velociraptor is known from the Dytrochat and Bayan Maduha formations, which would have been comprised of arid, sandy environments with intermittent rivers and seasonal lakes, a habitat not too dissimilar to that of what is now modern Mongolia. Here it would have fulfilled a role of a small predator and may have lived in small family groups, or solitary, in groups of like less than six individuals. On Carhorinchus rastrosus, on Corhi, no, it's on Corhinchus rastrosus, also known as a saber-toothed salmon, is an extinct species of salmon that lived in the Pacific Northwest of North America throughout the late Miocene and early Pliocene periods. First described by Cavender and Miller in 1972. Uh, the adults of this species grew up to between 6 and 9 feet in length and around 400 pounds in weight. Besides being the largest member of the Pacific salmon genus Onchiharynchus, or Onchorhynchus, uh, members of this species are famous for sporting a pair of up to 4 inch long fangs that protrude horizontally from either side of the snout tip, thus explaining the common name and pseudonym saber toothed salmon. These fangs were most likely used as weapons in interpacific combat, as well as to move rocks and other debris in the lake slash riverbeds uh, in order to better secure their eggs when spawning. Beyond their fangs, adults of O. Rasterus had larger gill rakers compared to their smaller modern relatives, leading many scientists to believe that the saber-toothed salmon primarily ate plankton. Like their modern-day relatives, it is believed they migrated up rivers from the sea to spawn, and it is believed that the saber toothed salmon faced extinction around 5 million years ago, due in large part to the cooling and drying brought on by the onset of the last major glaciation event, and this ultimately led to the drying up of the rivers and lakes that it used to spawn, leading to the species' extinction. Next up is Mammut Americanum, or more commonly known as the American Mastodon. It is one of the best known and among the last surviving species of mastodon, with the earliest occurrences of it dating to between the from the middle Pliocene around 3.5 million years ago. But the first remains of the species were attributed to a five and a half pound tooth recovered in Claverack, New York, in 1705. Uh, the mysterious animal became known as the Incongitum, with several speculations proposed to just what this beast was ranging from monstrous predators to dragons to even giants from biblical myth. In 1739, French soldiers at present-day Big Bone Lick State Park, Kentucky, found the first bones to be collected and studied scientifically. Similar teeth to the 1705 specimen were found in South Carolina, where some enslaved African people recognized them as being similar to the teeth of modern elephants. After this, people started referring to the incognitum as a mammoth, and like the ones that were just like the ones that were being dug out of the Siberian permafrost at the time. Uh, and in 1796, the French scientist Georges Cuvier proposed the radical idea that mammoths were not simply elephant bones that had been somehow transported north, but the species but were species which no longer existed. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach assigned the scientific name Mammut to the American incognitum uh, in 1799 under the assumption they belonged to mammoths as well. Uh, other anatomists know the teeth of mammoths and elephants differed from those of the incognitum, which possessed rows of large conical cusps indicating they were dealing with a distinct species. In 1817, Cuvier uh, named the incognitum Mastodon, and today the American Mastodon is known for fossil sites ranging from Alaska, Ontario, and New England in the north, to Florida, Southern California, and as far south as Honduras. Standing between 7 and 10 feet tall at the shoulder and weighing between 7 and 9 tons, Mastodons were very similar in appearance to elephants and to a lesser degree mammoths, um, though they are not close related to either one. Compared to mammoths, mastodons had shorter legs and a longer body with a dense, more robust skeleton, a low and longer skull, and longer, less curved tusks. However, the most significant difference is the shape and function of the teeth, 
In mammoths and elephants, the teeth are a nearly flat surface that is often used for grinding and shearing grass. Uh, the American Mastodon molars instead sport rounded cusps uh, that were covered in hard enamel that formed pairs of rows. Uh, these were used for snapping and chewing branches and leaves from trees and shrubs. Uh, as forest dwelling promiscinians, uh, Mastodons would frequent the woodlands and forests of North Central America until a combination of changing climate and overhunting by early humans drove them to extinction roughly. 10,500 years ago. Next up is Protoceratops, because we can't cover Velociraptor without covering Protoceratops, and vice versa. Uh, Protoceratops is a genus of herbivorous ceratops and dinosaurs that lived throughout what is now Mongolia and China during the Capanian stage of the Upper Cretaceous period. It was a member of the Protoceratopsidae, a group of early horned dinosaurs that, unlike the later Ceratopsians, uh, were much smaller creatures that lacked well-developed horns and retained some more basal traits not seen in later genera. Photographer James Blaine Shackelford discovered the first specimen of Protoceratops in the Gobi Desert as part of a 1922 American expedition to look for human ancestors. Over the next hundred years, several other specimens have been found, including the infamous fighting dinosaur find that was previously mentioned, uh, where it preserves the Protoceratops and Velociraptor who died while locked in combat after they were buried during, uh, by a sand dune. As of 2021, two species of Protoceratops are recognized, Protoceratops andrusi and Protoceratops helicocorn hinus. Measuring between 5 and 7 feet in length, 2 feet tall at the shoulder, and 180 pounds in weight, Protoceratops is a quadrupedal dinosaur that was particularly characterized by its distinctive neck frill that joined from the back of the skull. The frill itself contained two large parental fenestrae, while its cheek had large jugal bones. The exact size and shape of the neck frill varied with it by individual, with some specimens having short, compact frills, while others had frills nearly half the length of the skull. Uh, Protoceratops had proportionally massive beaks and muscular jaws capable of a powerful bite. These jaws were packed with dozens of teeth and were well suited for chewing through tough vegetation. In life, Protoceratops would have been a Catherine Merle browsing herbivore, which would have traveled in herds throughout its arid environment in search of food and water until its extinction some 70 million years ago. Next up is a personal favorite, Charovopteryx, which is a genus of early gliding reptiles from the middle of the late Triassic Kazakhstan, uh, and contains a single species, Charovopteryx mirabilis. S. Mirabilis is known from a unique holotype specimen recovered in 1965 in the Matajin Formation in the Dais Lukshu on the southwest edge of the Fergana Valley in Kazakhstan, uh, in what was then the USSR. Uh, it was first described by Alexander Gorovich Sharva in 1971, who named the species Podoprotopteryx. Mirabilis, meaning foot wing for the wing membranes on the hind limbs. However, that name had previously been used for a genus of damselfly, so in 1981 Richard Cohen created the new genus named Charovopteryx, naming the animal after Charvo. The anatomy and proportions of Charovopteryx are un remarkably unique, superficially resembling a 9 to 10 inch long body lizard like reptile with enormous membrane bound legs. Skin impressions adjacent to the skull, torso, and feet show the body was covered in a small series of overlapping scales, and the head was small and narrow with a short snout, large eyes, small nostril openings, and at least 15 sharp, widely spaced teeth on each jaw. The neck and trunk were long and narrow and approximately equal length. The narrow tail was at least as long as the body and neck combined, and the front limbs were small, with the hind limbs being remarkably long, sporting a set of expansive, scaleless membranes extending from the base of the tail, along the posterior margin of the leg, and down to the fifth toe. In 2006, Dyke et al. published a, a study on the possible gliding techniques for Charovopteryx, and the authors found that the wing membrane was stretched between the very long hind legs and tail, uh, would have allowed the animal to glide as like a delta wing aircraft does. If the tiny front limbs also sport a membrane, they could have acted as a very efficient means of controlling pitch stability, allowing for excellent control of gliding.
Unfortunately, the area around the forelimbs was completely prepared away in the only known fossil specimen, destroying any possible trace of a membrane there. In life, Charovopteryx uh, would have lived in and around forests and swamps along the other Triassic oddballs such as Logosquama, Manigurpodon, and Gigatitan. Spending much of its time in tree canopies, Charovopteryx would have hunted small vertebrates, insects, and other arthropods uh, until the end of the Triassic until the intra-acid extinction event wiped out it and many other species some 201 million years ago. And our extant animal of the week is also a fossil, being the West Indian Ocean man coelacanth. I don't know why I said manatee. Also known as the gombesa, the African coelacanth, or simply, excuse me, the coelacanth. It was one of two extant species of coelacanth, a rare order uh, vertebrates were more closely related to lungfish and tetrapods than the common rayfin fishes, with the other species of coelacanth being the Indonesian coelacanth. Reaching upwards of 6.5 feet in length, 175 pounds in weight, uh, females of the species average slightly longer, larger than males, with both sexes exhibiting a deep royal blue color, with spots used as a camouflage tactic for avoiding predators as well as hunting prey. Uh, they sport large eyes packed with visual rods to aid in seeing in dark water. And similar to carlaginous fish, the elecanths have a rectal gland, pituitary gland, pancreas, and spinal cord. West Indian coelacanths are usually found between 590 and 690 feet underwater, but sometimes found at depths of up to 800 feet and as shallow as 175 feet. Historically known by fishermen around the Comoro Islands, Madagascar, and Mozambique as the Gombesa, the West Indian coelacanth was first scientifically recognized from a specimen collected near South Africa in 1938, when Captain Hendrik Gulson trawled one up from the ocean depths and proceeded to send the specimen to his friend Marjorie Courtenay Latner, uh, the curator at the East London Museum in South Africa. The museum, at the museum, the fish was recognized by Professor J. L. B. Smith as a coelacanth, known only to science up to that point by fossils from fossils. The two discoverers received immediate recognition with the fish now labeled as a living fossil. Over the next nine decades, several more specimens have been captured, and recently coelacanth was even filmed live in its natural habitat of underwater lava caves. Some individuals have been seen performing unique behaviors called headstands, uh, allowing the coelacanth to slurp prey from crevices within the rock. This behavior is made possible due to the coelacanth's ability to move both its upper and lower jaw independently and simultaneously, which is a unique trait in extant vertebrates that have bone skeletons. These coelacanths are, uh, are an ovoviparous species, which means they retain their eggs internally until they hatch. They also have a low fecundity rate due to their long gestation period of around 12 months. And outside of this, little is known about the life and maturity cycle of the coelacanths. What we do know, however, is that the West Indian coelacanth is a critically endangered species with less than 500 individuals on Earth. As always, take care to my guys, gals, non-binary pals. Happy Fossil Day.